Uh, I'll now ask uh, uh, Ubin Zhuang to come up uh, on, onto the stage. He's a writer, curator, and artist. Uh, he focuses on the photographic practices of Southeast Asia and Hong Kong. And he uses the medium as a prism to explore photography in the visualization of Chinese Chineseness. He looks at periodicals and photo books as sites of historiography and the imprint of nationalism and the Cold War on photography. A 2010 recipient of the research grant from the Prince Klaus Fund, uh, he's an editorial board member of the Trans Asia Photography Review, which is a very important uh, online journal on photography. Um, he is a recipient of the Lee Kong Chiang um, Research Fellowship for 2017, um, given by the National Film Bo uh, Library Board of Singapore. He has been invited to research residency programs at the Institute of Technology of Bandung, the Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong, the Kuandu Museum of Fine Arts at Taiwan, um, uh, and the Ha Bik Chuen uh, Archive Project at, at AAA. He's also the contrib contributing um, curator of the Biennale uh, at, the, at the Chiang Mai uh, Photo Festival in 2015 and 17. Um, his fourth book, he's written several books, but his fourth book was Photography in Southeast Asia Survey. Um, and his fifth publication is Shifting Currents, Glimpses of a Changing Nation, um, which features the work of a Singaporean photographer. Um, and um, as an artist, he uses photography and text to visualize the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian Chinese communities and their shifting experiences of Chineseness. So I'm going to invite Yuvin to come on the stage. Especially Puch Pamala for inviting me uh, to this conference. I feel the burden of uh, responsibility because I'm portrayed as a photo historian of Southeast Asia. But Southeast Asia really consists of 10 different countries with very complex politics, multiple languages. So I don't feel like, even though I've just put out the book, uh, Photography in, uh, in Southeast Asia in 2016, I don't feel I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the only person that should be, I'm, I'm not the person that, that should be representing the region. But the, the other thing that I should want to say right at the start is that we, we do need more conversations between South Asia and Southeast Asia. I think that, that is something that's quite lacking. So um, I'm not going to really talk about my book. Uh, I'm working on a few extensions of, uh, from this book. Uh, I have a shameless pitch. Actually, I, I brought a few copies. I cannot give this away, but if you, if you want to buy it, I can give you the author's discount. Um, I'm, I'm not a Vietnam studies. Uh, I'm not a Vietnam studies expert, but I'm going to talk about the Vietnam War. And we, in our minds, we have a lot of images of Vietnam. I think a lot of people would have seen this image, but in fact, you have never seen this image because the image that you saw was Malcolm Brown's image. Malcolm Brown shot the immolation of uh, of Tik Quan Tik Quan Du on 1963, but this image was actually made by a Vietnamese photographer, Nguyen Ban Tong, uh, who worked for the Southern government. So this is the kind of experiences that we get in Vietnam. You see something and you think you, you, you've seen it, but actually this is not the image that you have seen. Um, and then there's a lot of stereotypes that exist within the north and the south of Vietnam. So to, to, to use a conceptual shorthand, let's call the north the winners, because the north were the communists, they reunited the country in 1975. So if you go and speak to a lot of these like old cultured people in Vietnam, especially from the North, they would have a kind of imagination of the South. So this is a typical gentleman, a, a photographer uh, who is based in the North. And, and so he talks about the stereotypes of photography in the North being much more cultured, being much more natural, and photography from the South being much more staged, uh, and, and things like that. So there, there are a lot of stereotypes that continue to exist. So the country has become reunited in 1975, uh, but, but these kind of divisions, these multiple Vietnams continue to exist. And there are, of course, projects in America. And obviously, uh, there is an interest in photography that were produced by the Vietnamese communists. So this is a very wonderful book. Uh, Produced, I think, in 20, 2002, National Geographic. Uh, it features photography from the Vietnamese communists working for the North. Uh, but if you notice, the title is called Another Vietnam. So it speaks from a position 
So this is obviously an American publication featuring photography from the Vietnamese colonies of the North. But it speaks on a position of one Vietnam referring to another Vietnam. So who speaks on behalf of who? In this case, obviously the American publishers, American curators, speaking on behalf of the southern government which was defeated, referring to the north. Now, I'm going to talk about the Vietnam War, but we should not, well, the Vietnam War is what we normally would remember the event. If you ask people in Vietnam, some people would call this the American War. Uh, but we have to remember that, that the Vietnam War is not an, was not an isolated event. It was situated within a regional conflict. And I, I feel it's much more appropriate to also remember the context of the two Indochina Wars. And typically, we would put the Vietnam War in the second Indochina War. Uh, this is a very short, uh, abbreviated history, but the, the key dates, it's 65, 1965, the US commit to bombing uh, and, and land troops in, in, in uh, Vietnam. And then 75, it's uh, the liberation of the South or the reunification. To the, the, to the South, it, it, it is another kind of invasion, but, but we'll, we'll leave politics for the time being. I'm, as a kind of conceptual shorthand, because I'm quite sure the history of Vietnam is not all that familiar to a lot of, uh, to some of us here. So as a kind of conceptual shorthand, I'm going to just call the North. So I, I, I basically divided the North and the South in this way. Basically, the North have interests and military forces also in the South. But for the sake, as a kind of conceptual shorthand, let's just call the North people that were kind of pro-communist. Of course, within this whole umbrella, there were nationalists and, and, and other forces. There were also forces deep in the South. So let's just, as a conceptual call, shorthand, just call them the North as the Vietnamese communists. The South, let's, as a kind of conceptual shorthand, represents the Republic of Vietnam government, uh, the American forces uh, working for the South. I'm actually going to look at, uh, do a close reading of two books. Um, and what I try to do here is a kind of like, I'm trying to be a little bit of a, you know, like, devil's advocate. I try not to start with the North-South divide. So I look at these two books as pure, pure productions, but of course they represent the politics of the North and the South. And I want to look at the biographies of the photographers, and I want to look at their participation in pictorialism, or what we would call in Southeast Asia as salon photography. I want to look at their involvement in pictorialism, their involvement in the wars and how they understood photography and their lives after 1975. And, and after this, after doing a quick, a close reading of these two books, I'll come to a kind of conclusion at the end. Well, this is an ongoing work on photography and co war, so just bear with me if my conclusion sounds a little bit rambling. Um, the first photographer that I'm going to talk about, who made uh, one of the books I'm going to talk about, his name is called Lam Tam Tai. Uh, don't quote me on the pronunciation, my pronunciation is not accurate, Lam Tam Tai. Uh, he actually was born in deep south Vietnam, but he worked for the north. So this is a guy native to the south, but he supported the Vietnamese communist liberation of the, the south. This is just a very brief biography, you see his portrait, he passed in 2001, uh, one of the most influential photographers working in support of the North. Um, and you can see the first two parts of his biography, the first two lines. It shows that he is, or he was closely related to the pictorialist movement, the pictorialism movement of Vietnam and the international scene. By the way, I should give a short, uh, short elaboration. The Vietnamese Association of Photographic Artists, that is a government organization first established in Hanoi, in communist Hanoi, to propagate you know, the education, the critique of Vietnamese photography. And of course, after reunification in 1975, it became the main orthodoxy of Vietnamese photography. So he's a very crucial member. And in 2000, he made this book called Wartime Photographs. So this is made, the images were made during the war, but the book is published many, many, many years. In fact, it was just published before he passed. And he was a photographer that worked on the line that cuts through Cambodia and Laos, which is why Vietnam War should not be thought of as a country-centric conflict. 
It's a regional conflict that affected everybody in the region. So he worked on this very famous Ho Chi Minh Trail, which the Americans were trying to bomb out. I'm just going to take you through some of the snippets of the book. His, his book is arranged in a very interesting way. It's actually chronological. So you see, first of all, he, his portraits appear in 19... His portrait appears, his self-portrait appears. Heroic Soldier, 1965. And then you see, you know, the, the very post image of the music and cultural group on your left. Uh, it's quite a common feature of uh, the communist. And on the right, on your, sorry, on your left, you see soldiers there, like, beating farewell to one another. So these are people that worked on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Many of them would never see each other after they bid goodbye, because this is one of the most heavily bombed. In fact, today, uh, if you look at by land mass, uh, Laos and Cambodia was much more heavily bombed than Vietnam. By land mass, if you, if you divide you know, the amount of bombing and across the land mass, of two countries. Now, Lam Tham Thai was also, remember the first book that I talked about, the, another Vietnam, the American book, right? He was also involved in that book. So he, he, he told his story to the interviewers. Um, I will not read everything, but I, I, I think the first paragraph is quite interesting. 1965 was the year of the escalation. He was drafted and ordered to go down south on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. For us southerners, it was a great honour and opportunity to be selected to go south, especially as a photographer. Only the most fit were chosen. We were motivated not only by patriotism, but also by a youthful sense of, or youthful spirit of adventure. So there was also the idea of going out, seeing the country, and part of this, and being part of this war effort to liberate Vietnam from America. But Going on the Ho Chi Minh Trail is no fun at all because even for him, while the war last, while the, the ground, the land war lasted for more than 10 years, he only made two trips. A trip would take him four months to walk. And many, many people suffered in the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This is a collection of, so this comes from a different book, it's a collection of uh, anecdotes and stories from the people that work on the trail. You can see it's completely uh, horrifying to be on the trail. Um, if you look at the first quote, on the section of, so this is a soldier, so this is a second lieutenant working for the north. On the section of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, going, going towards Kong Tum every day, we saw groups of wounded soldiers coming home. So while you are going down, you will see the soldiers coming back on the other side. Some of them had been burned by Napalm, others were deformed or blind. We used to say to each other, when you reach the south, try to keep your face intact. So try to keep your face intact without being bombed. So the book, but if you look at his book, there's almost no kind of depiction of that kind of violence. But in this final book that he made before he passed away, there's this small little section looking at, looking at the enemy of the, the enemy of the enemy's crimes. If you look at the bottom lower right section, if you look at the bottom lower right section, there's a body that is opened up by, uh, by the guerrilla forces. And during Vietnam War, such images would not be shown by the North for multiple reasons. I'll come back to this a little bit later. So during the, during the war, the Northern communists would never show these kind of images of death and violence. So instead, you see, like, you know, people preparing for war. So this is a very important event of the war. This is the Tet Offensive, 1968, where the North took control of Central Vietnam for a very, very short period of time, liberated Central Vietnam, and shocked America beyond the imagination. So this is a really important event. In fact, Lam Tham Thai was in Saigon photographing the conflict, and he lost an eye during the Tet Offensive. Most of the people that covered Tet Offensive died. He lost an eye, he survived. But if you look at the book, there's almost no portrayal of that. It's just people preparing for the Tet Offensive. And then, of course, you see in the liberated zones in the south, people going through, you know, building new lives, uh, leading liberated lives. So this is still within the Vietnam War. 
but in southern parts there were some places that were already liberated so this is how if you look at this small little image this is how the images were actually used they would go to a liberated zone and they set up a public exhibition so people would come and look at the war efforts you can see actually these two images remind us that this is a regional conflict so this is when Lam Tham Thai went to Cambodia and photographed the murderous Khmer Rouge this is before Khmer Rouge became in power the Cambodian communist in 1975 so this is before that so there was this fraternity of the Indochina communists although very quickly it, after 75 it quickly broke down as most of them rebuilt its nationalistic inclinations so this is the part about Cambodia and then you see this image of this I, I don't like the word but but let's let's call this slightly artistic montage of four images commemorating death you have to remember that during the war to express uh, any kind of anxiety or wariness of the war is not prohibited you either have to be with us or against us you cannot even say that you are you want you advocate for a certain kind of peace so this is quite a striking inclusion here and bear in mind this is the last book that he made so he tried as much as he could to push the boundaries of what it was possible in Vietnam and this is the start of the peace the Paris Accords which eventually led to uh, 1975 reunification of the country this image on your left looks quite like a throwaway image but this is quite a striking image as well because it, it tells you that if you look at that there's four heads there's four conic like semi spherical heads and one head this this represents the two Vietnam's fighting and this is not a narrative that was very welcome because the narrative for the North was we are trying to kick the Americans out but they did not necessarily recognize that they were fighting another national Vietnam in the south so this image is quite a striking image and also would not be permitted to be published during the war so this is all published post event and of course you know the burden of uh, sacrifice and death so this is again how the images are used in the liberated zone in the south and at the end of the book you can see a kind of cinematic uh, montage of the communists moving into Saigon again the tank and then the final image of peace but I think it also represents also the burden of war by that time they had the, the North had already fought over 30 years of uh, resistance, resistance against first the French then of course Americans and yeah so this this is a kind of critique that comes from a scholar Vietnamese American scholar uh, a friend Mina Hien in uh, New York and, and she wrote specifically about Lam Tham Thai and, and, and I think it's quite important for us so just bear with me if I just read this so he according to Nina Lam Tham Thai was honest and progressive in his thoughts and told me that the biggest mistake of Vietnamese photography made was that it glossed over the realities of the war this happened in part because of the restrictions that forbade the shooting of ongoing battle scenes and wounded soldiers for fear that this evidence would reveal the weaknesses of the troops undermine morale and if enlarged exposed locations to the enemy predisposed against documentary and sport news which shows life and death unfolding brutality violence and overly sharp and graphic content ugly things should not enter the frame in Vietnamese photography if you jump a few lines if you look at the, 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 the other part that I highlighted instead stage poses depicting the sweet and sincere smiles the easy-going faces of camera-loving soldiers, happy scenes of life, you know, those were displayed more prominently. Uh, there's a little bit of an issue with how she characterized documentary and sport news. This is why I highlighted, because in this kind of categorization, documentary and sport news has to be, has to show violence in, in a short way, in a, in a, in a, sh in a short hand. Now, there's a kind of counter view comes from anthropologist Christina and she writes about the, the, war, the, the images that were published by the Vietnamese communists and her argument was, goes something like this unlike the graphic images of trauma and death routinely displayed in we Western media 
Images in Vietnam also reflected optimistic and hopeful futures, as well as the everyday routine present. So this broader approach of constituting a visual history of the war diverges from Western practices of objective journalism. These practices implicitly assume that capturing disaster and devastation on film is the most authentic manifestation of realism, what she calls capitalist realism, based on the belief that free and open access to violence signifies neutral balance and truthful information. So if you combine these two ideas, right, you can kind of map a kind of like dichotomy. On one side you have, on your left you have this capitalist realism, free access to violence, unstaged images, and all these unstaged images then represent neutral balance, truthful images, and this is where you usually put documentary and war photography, and there's also a focus on trauma. And on the other side, you usually see, okay, absence of, this is more applicable to Vietnam. On the right side, this is what they say, more applicable to Vietnamese photography, absence of violence, stage images, more propagandistic images, and there's a focus on hopeful futures and everyday present. I have about 10 minutes, so I come to the second book. This second book is produced during the war, produced by the South, and actually today is fairly unknown in Vietnam. It's called Vietnam in Flames. It's published in 1969. The book that I'm showing is uh, a copy from the National Library of Singapore. It's made by two photographers. Uh, the first photographer, Nguyen Mạc Dan, he actually just passed away this morning. Um, if you look at this, is his short bio. If you just look at the last two lines, you can see that he was completely involved in pictorialism and salon photography. In fact, he made a name for himself being a salon photographer, a pictorial photographer. And he was also born in the north. The other photographer that was involved in this project is called Nguyen Nok Hai. And he was born as a colonial orphan, taken into the French army and then given an education, eventually studied photography in France. Come, comes back, came back to Vietnam and then served in the army. So this is an army officer who was also a photographer. He just passed. Uh, after the war, he went, he was sent because he worked for the army. So he was sent for re-education. Eight years and then eventually he fled Vietnam, went to California and he passed away in California. If you look again, 1957, 1961, if you look at the last line, again he was completely imbricated in salon photography, in pictorialism. And the book opens with a glimpse, history, a glimpse of history uh, which is written by another historian and also an army officer. I, I'm not going to read this for the sake of time but just to say that, just to say that uh, from the perspective of the South, they were also fighting another kind of foreign intervention. For them, the foreign intervention was Mao Zedong and the Soviet Union. So there was also another kind of nationalism based in the South, supported by US interests within the Cold War politics. The book opens with close combat scenes. So this is clearly different from the first book, and this is bear in mind published during the war. It's the version that I have is the version that a library has is actually in English. Um, so it's meant for an English international reading audience. Starts with cold conflict, fighting, and then suddenly it goes to this very idyllic landscape image that would exist in any kind of pictorial catalog, salon photography catalog. Then it goes to the Tet Offensive. So this is again the 1968 very famous Tet Offensive in Hue. And you can see that this book, while it has more access to the soldiers, it's not ideologically free or neutral. You can see the captions. They were trying to portray the fact that they were treating the communist soldiers very well, even though they became POWs. And then you see these two idyllic images again. These would have sat in any of the pictorial magazines or pictorialism uh, catalogs. And then again, it goes to photographs of the war, you know, parachuters. And you come to this image. Uh, if, you, if you know Vietnam well enough, every single, I mean, I, I'm probably exaggerating, but almost every single Vietnamese photo book would have an image of the Vietnamese woman in the outside. The traditional Vietnamese costume. It's almost like the woman body is the body that embodies the nation.
and the hopeful futures of the nation. Both the South and the North use it. Again, you can see that the caption shows that this is not an ideologically neutral book. But also, it's, it deserves a kind of gendered reading. Because what's the role of the woman in the war? Both the North and the South use women as part of the war efforts. And this is, of course, sufficient to do another paper on its own. Again, the caption tells us the bias of the publishers and the photographers. Now, the last section of the book, we see attempts to kind of rebuild the country. So you know that they are trying to say that the North were the aggressors, we're trying to rebuild this war-torn South. I want to speak a little bit about this image. This is one of the most classical images of Vietnamese photography. It's shot in the sand dunes. It's so famous among the pictorial photographers or the pictorialist photographers that even people in Singapore talked about, I'm, I'm talking about 1950s, 1960s, even amateur photographers in Singapore talked about this landscape because they would say that if you want to make an award-winning picture, go to this beautiful landscape in Vietnam and make this photograph. So this book is a very interesting book because it's a kind of hybrid product that has both combat photography but at the same time salon photography mixed together. And of course, at the end they place again a kind of image that suggests a wariness of the war. This is the ending image. Now, I mean, from where I come from, Southeast Asia, there's, there's not a lot of interest in salon photography or pictorialism because typically we think of it as quite conservative and backward. But I'm, I have always been interested in pictorialism and salon photography. So this is a kind of mapping of all the photo clubs that was established well, this is a selected mapping, this is not everything. A selected mapping of all the photo clubs that promoted pictorialism in Asia, in, particularly in East Asia and Southeast Asia. And you can see 1920s was the first period. So right at the colonial period, it was one of the first era of growth. But 1950s, following efforts to decolonize, there was also another boom. There was also another boom. And Nguyen Nok Hai, the guy that was sent to re-education, he founded the KBC Photo Club KBC Saigon 1957. So this is the this is the second exhibition of KBC Photo Club in Saigon before the war ended. So this is a club photograph uh, founded by the army officer Nguyen Nok Hai, and you can see there is a section of his work. So you can see the images that was produced in the previous book was also reproduced in this exhibition catalog of pictorialism. So you can see combat photography entering the so-called neutral arena of pictorialism. You can see the same images that we saw in the book reappears in this exhibition catalog. But at the same time, he shows you that he is or he was a great pictorial photographer. He knew the ideas of light, contrast, movement, color, Things like that, things that you will win you awards. Unfortunately, I, I, I suspect it's because he was also an army officer. So he was sent to re-education camp after 75 and he survived. Actually, many people didn't survive the camp. He survived and seven, in 83, he started making his attempt to, to leave Vietnam. Eventually, he had ended up in San Jose. Uh, and, 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 and live there for the remaining part of his life. So if you, this was taken from one of the interviews uh, by another reporter in the US. I never got to meet him actually, he's based in California. He was based in California. And you can see that obviously he remains, you know, he retains a certain hatred for the communists. How am I doing? What time? Five? Yeah? Okay. Now, so that is Nguyen Nok Hai. And for the other photographer, Nguyen Mạc Dan, well, these two photographers, in fact, were born in the north. And Nguyen Mạc Dan, who just passed away this morning, also had a very interesting history. I never got to meet him, actually, as well, because I didn't know that he was actually still around. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the interesting thing about him was that he was born also in the north. And in 1954, his family moved to the south. If you remember, 1954, 
was the time where the Vietnamese communists took complete control of the north. So at that year, the family moved to the south. So I don't know what does this mean. Does it mean that the family was not too excited about the prospects of living under the communists in the north? But we know that in 54, he moved to the south. And he was involved in the so-called first photo art exhibition of Vietnam, which was started in 1952. So this is the 1952 art exhibition, Hanoi Opera House. And this is an attempt by the Vietnamese photographers gathering the photographers from the north, central and the south to do supposedly the first art exhibition in Hanoi. But so this is in some ways we can say, I mean, in, al in alignment to some of the, the presentations that have already gone on at the start, the imaginings of a unified Vietnam through photography. But this imagination was, all, for me, is really interesting because it also consisted of others. Because Chinese photographers were also involved in this exhibition. So there were Chinese photographers, there were Vietnamese Chinese photographers also involved in this exhibition, 1952. In fact, one of them would eventually move to Hong Kong, which is where I'm going to track his life. One of them moved to Hong Kong and became a pro-China communist photographer. So there is a lot of these kind of interconnections uh, in between the nations. Nguyen Mạc Dan was involved in the second exhibition and this was his submission. A very interesting image. Uh, it's very hard to place. And Nguyen, Nguyen Mạc Dan, for some reason, he was kind of reincorporated into the nation. Uh, I don't know whether he was sent, even though he worked for the South, I didn't know, I don't know whether he was sent to re-education. But many years later, he continued to publish books. So this is a photographer whose images was published in a book that propagated the Southern Vietnamese politics. But in some ways, I don't know why, he was recuperated into the national narrative. And then he published this book called My Homeland in Vietnam. He published many books after the war. This is, this is a slight detour, right? This is 1996. You can see this is the typical, what you would call a salon photography image. But the images that appear in the book is reincorporated into this national imaginary, the beloved, the eternal Vietnam. You can see all these images that appear in Vietnam in flames reappears as this imagination of an uh, internal Vietnam. How much time do I have? Five? I have five? Oh, okay, good. Sure? Okay. Um, so I, I've kind of put up a mapping of, of these two books um, as a kind of comparison. On both sides, the photographers were all involved in pictorialism. I think on both sides, they were somewhat aware that they were making a kind of historical record. But and on both sides, there was also nationalistic impulse. But the nationalistic impulse was described or felt in a different way. So in wartime photographs, the book that was published for the South, it was against, well, sorry, wartime photographs, the book that was photographed on your left, the book that was photographed and produced for the North communists. I think Obviously, it was meant as a kind of document against American imperialism and its puppet, the South Vietnamese government. But if you look at Vietnam in flames on your right, there's also another kind of nationalistic impulse. It was a kind of attempt to garner international support for the resistance against the North. And of course, without really, I mean, we, we, it's quite clear also that the connection between the North and China and Soviet Union. So there was also a kind of nationalistic impulse within the South. Now, if you look at both books and you think carefully about it, in fact, both books use staged and straight photography. It's not as though the book that was published in the South used only straight and neutral and you know on the scene capture. They also use stage photography like the woman in the outside that's all staged. That cannot be straight photography. So both sides use stage and straight photography. I think both sides, if you would agree with me, are ideologically driven. And on the left, the, the book published for the North, combat is not really depicted. On the, the, the book, on the other hand, Vietnam in Flames, combat is depicted. But, you know, the wartime photographs, the, the book that is published for the North, there's less violence 
shown. But if you think carefully about Vietnam in flames, the book that was published for the South, the violence is also only implied. There is closer access to combat, but there's very few actually uh, images of violence. If we come back to the dichotomy, it complicates this very simplistic dichotomy. Um, and if you were asked, if you were to ask me how to place these two books along a kind of spectrum, if we assume that this is a dichotomy, how do you place these two books? I, I would actually think that both books sit quite close to the right. And our, our assumption, and especially if you look at the Vietnamese Americans, Vietnamese diaspora in, in, in the US, one of the things that they would usually assume is that the South had So when can we come to a situation, or is there a situation where cultural politics or cultural production can be free of politics? Now, I, I will I'll read my conclusion. So for the present Vietnam to emerge, other Vietnams, other ways of envisioning the nation, other ways of thinking about Vietnam were sidelined, were vanquished, or even incorporated into the present unified Vietnam. So the examples here show testament to these other visions of Vietnam. First of all, what does this presentation tell us about salon photography or pictorialism? We often assume that salon photography is neutral, is ideologically free. Because how, how political can you get with a beautiful landscape of Vietnam? Images of wrinkled old ladies and fishing boats. But I argue that it is precisely because of this illusion of neutrality that allows salon photography to be utilized for contrasting political projects. There's of course a very serious and practical reason. When the authorities come to you and say, I mean when the authorities come to you as cultural practitioners and say, work for us, you know, the, the, the choice in a total state of war is very, very stuck. You, you can't even say, mm, let me think about it. Because if you say, let me think about it, it already implies that you might not be supportive of me or you are even sympathetic to the enemy. So the, the choice is cast in black and white. You are with us or you are not with us. And I think this is very, this is still something that affects us today. So this is not something that's far in the distance. This affects cultural production even today. What is the distance between politics and cultural production? Can there be any distance? Do we need a distance? Now, coming back to the two photo books, in the case of Lam Tham Thai, the photographer that worked for the North, he made a book called Wartime Photographs, his sacrifice, he lost an eye for the North, puts him on the right side of history, right side of the Vietnamese communist history. And because of his major influence, he was able to push the envelope, because he was so closely related to the war, he was able to push the envelope a little bit with his final book, a little bit. And based on what I hear, he was also involved in the American book, the Another Vietnam. And I'm quite sure it's because of him that most of the old photographers were willing to speak to the American editors and to be involved in that project. Uh, because if you go to the North and if you go to speak to the communist photographers even today, many of them are quite unwilling to speak about the past. Um, if we come to the second book, Vietnam in Flames, the book that was made for the South, you will see that in Nguyen Mạc Dan's landscape work, we can see that has been kind of recuperated within the national imaginary, the eternal Vietnam. And I think it's precisely because he understood the beauty of salon photography, how to make a beautiful pictorial image, that his images become you know, the site to think about this eternal Vietnam, which then becomes reincorporated within the national imaginary. For the case of Nguyen Ngoc Han, the, war, the, army, the army man, so even though he was an acclaimed photographer, his involvement in the army meant that he had to serve re-education. Um, but we also realize that this is a person that did not choose his life. He was born as a colonial orphan, taken from the orphanage to serve the French army 
sent to France to study photography and then sent back to serve the South Vietnamese government. So in some ways, his life was not something that he could totally control, at least in the early stage of his life. So anyway, my, 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 my final statement would be, I think his photographs await younger photographers in Vietnam to rediscover, to recontextualize within, maybe within the other visions of Vietnam that continue to exist today. Thanks.